I'm Kevin Elmy. In this presentation, we're going to be talking about how to manage saline soils. The first step we should take is we should define what a saline soil is. Ray Wheel has defined saline soils as soils dominated by neutral salts and a pH less than 8.5. Whereas a saline sodic soil is defined as saline soils with high sodium concentrations. Sodic soils, on the other hand, are soils with high sodium levels but low soluble salt concentrations with a pH greater than 8.5. So this would be our solenetic soils. In this presentation, we'll be just be talking about the, the saline soils. If the enemy is too much salt in our soil, how do we solve it? Number one, what does what's causing this salt to accumulate? Is this area of salinity new? Or is it known as a potentially saline area or has been saline in the past? Has the weather pattern changed? So are we getting more rain than normal, less rain than normal? How is that changing? Has our cropping management changed? Are we doing more tillage, less tillage? What crops are we growing? When are they using water? How much water do they use? Uh, what kind of root system do they have? Those will influence the, the salinity change. How deep is a water table? If we're dealing with a, a deep water table or a shallow water table? And then the other question is, is there a local body of water that is creating uh, saline development? When we have the, the start of salinity, first of all, what we'll see is reduced plant growth and crop yield. That's gonna be the first step, and that's what will alert us. The other thing we may see is some phosphate deficiencies in our crop. We will start seeing weeds like kochia and foxtail barley start to, to show their faces. We may see appearance of drought symptoms in, in a year where the, the moisture is, is adequate, but we'll see these pockets where the, the plants are struggling. Now, the soil may or may not turn white as a, a a stereotypical saline area. That white in the soil, in the soil surface, will be determined by what kind of salt we have. So anything that tends to be a magnesium salt will leave a white crust on the surface, whereas a sodium salt will just be a, a black surface. When we start looking at these saline soils, we need to identify where this salt is coming from. Is it due to a hillside seep? And the hillside seep is where water, when we have a slope, and it could be within the field or it could you know, be over um, a large distance, where the water will seep into the soil, go through the soil, and then come up to the surface. And it doesn't have to be a low spot. It could be in the middle of a, of a slope. It could be at the end. It could be close to the top. But we need to know where this water is coming from. We can have what they call a bathtub ring around the sluice. We can have capillary movement from parent material. And this is where that higher water table, the, the water can seep up and it can push some salts up. If we have irrigation, this irrigated water can be a source of salinity. So we should have our water tested to make sure we're not adding more problem to our, our, our issue. Or it can be due to water, the water soil hydrology being messed up. And this is where if you're driving along a highway, you may see a, a strip of salinity about 100 meters off the road. The first 50 meters, the crop is looking normal, but when we get out a little further, we see a strip of salinity and then the field then recovers again. This is the, you know, once again, much like the, the, the bathtub ring where the water uh, is, is being blocked, it's infiltrating into the ground and then pushing up further away from, from the, in this case, the road or the railroad tracks. And then we get this, this sign of salinity, then the, the crop uh, recovers and, and uh, the salinity is, is reduced. So when we start looking at managing the soils, so what do we have to do to, to start reclaiming these soils? The first thing we need to do is stop evaporation. So evaporation occurs when we don't have anything growing 
and the water leaves the soil surface. When the soil leaves the soil surface, the salts cannot evaporate also, so what will happen is those salts are left right at the surface. If we use evapotranspiration, then we have fixed the issue. When we have evapotranspiration, this is the evaporation from the plant leaves of the water vapor. In this case, the, the plant's roots are down into the soil. They're using the water before that water gets to the surface to evaporate. The plant then uses that water, and then the water then leaves the leaves, through the leaves to the stomata. In this case, when the water is used in the soil, deeper in the soil, those salts are then stranded in the soil. Or in some cases, like sugar beets, the sugar, the, the sugar beet will then take up that salt and then create a vacuole within the, the cell, the root cell, and store that salt in so that the plant can then handle that, that salt, high salt uh, soil. So we want to reduce, you know, that, that evaporation and we need to cover the soil, ideally with plants. If it is that saline where nothing will grow, this is where we want, we want to do is create a cover for that soil. In this case, what we'll want to do is, you know, uh, take some straw bales, something with a wide carbon to nitrogen ratio, and anything with a wide carbon nitrogen ratio is going to rot slowly. Something with a, a tight carbon to nitrogen ratio, so alfalfa bales, uh, uh, something that's green and young, will rot down very quickly. We want to create a blanket over that soil so this way that water doesn't have a chance to evaporate. We want to then get more plants, more seeds seeded into that to try and get something established to get it growing. We need to stop the salts being deposited at the soil surface. We need to be able to push those down and that's through infiltration. The other thing we want to do is we want to bring up calcium, uh, increase the calcium in these areas. When we have calcium uh, being reintroduced to these systems. In these systems, are, especially when we're dealing with, with a, a, a high sodium concentration in these areas, the sodium then uh, you know, overwhelms the, the, uh, the, the, the exchange sites, uh, the cation exchange capacity uh, on these particles. And what we want to do, because sodium is a, a positive one charge in the soil, calcium is a positive two, we want to bring up more calcium and that calcium is going to be held onto these exchange sites on the, the, on the, the clay in particular. It, 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 takes, it takes up two, so this way it helps to, to flocculate or fluff up that soil. When we do that, then the sodium is now available in the soil solution and we then it's able to be able to leach to leach away. We can add uh, a calcium fertilizer, but when we start doing that, there is the potential of messing up the uh, things like phosphate. Uh, the calcium can then bind with the phosphate and and start reducing numbers there. So it's it's a little scary from that standpoint. Whereas when we use plants and where the calcium is located in plant cells and the plant cells is normally a, a, a very large proportion is in the cell walls. So the more cell walls we have growing in the soil, the more calcium we're bringing up. So when we have a big root like a tuber crop, like a beet, a turnip, a radish, that's going to have a significant amount of calcium that it is bringing up and storing and being able to release back into the soil. Sunflower is another good one to be using, and sweet clover, uh, another real good uh, taproot with some good uh, salinity tolerance. So these are the options that we can use, and the, the advantage of having the plants over the, the, the chemical fertilizer is that it is balanced. The nutrients are balanced, so the calcium already has the phosphate, already has the zinc, already has the rest of the nutrients that that next plant that's going to try growing is going to be available for it. The root channels are really important in this case because what we're going to want to do is we want that water to infiltrate and take those salts deeper into that soil. Basically what we're going to be doing is diluting that, that salt concentration at the surface, pushing it down deeper into the soil that it's going to do less damage to our, our system and, and as we keep 
managing this and keep driving down the salts, uh, getting more roots going deeper. The, the, the old saying of the solution to pollution is dilution. So what we're doing is diluting those salts, pushing them down deep and managing them for the future so that this way they, they don't want to keep pushing up and, and creating issues for you, for you. The other thing with these deep top roots is they're using water deep in the profile. So once again, just it's making that system work for us. Like I said, the, the, the root channels, it allows that excess, excess salts to leach down into the soil. And the, the, the real fun thing with nature is as we get roots, we get root exudates, we get biology, then we create more and more soil structure. And with that soil structure, it, it, things just start working so much better for us. Because as those root exudates get released, producing more biology, the biology needs somewhere to live, so they create homes for themselves. So it aerates that soil, aggregates the soil. We're starting to get that system fixed. I talked about earlier about hillside seeps or bathtub ring or round sloughs. We need to then identify where this water source is coming from. So in, in this... Uh, in the illustration on the right, in this case, we talk about the, uh, uh, Dr. Henry talks about the, 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 the uh, bathtub ring effect. So that in this case, we have the a slough. So a slough accumulates runoff water. Water is sitting there. Water then slowly infiltrates into the soil. And then the water will start pushing out east and west instead of up and down. And when it moves out, then it starts, through capillary action, starts coming back up. Then when it comes to the surface, evaporates, and now we have a, a, a salt issue. Around this bathtub ring, right near the water, so there's going to be a, a strip between the water and where the salinity starts showing up, where there's going to be, in quotes, normal crop production. And this is where... If we know that the water is going down into the soil, going over and then coming up, we need to have some deep rooted perennials growing in that place where there's normal crop production to intercept that water, use that water to keep the salts down so then we can reclaim those, those bathtub rings. And that is, once again, uh, you know, we're going to be losing a little bit of cropland, but the, what we're going to be losing is going to be that 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 good stuff right around the slough, but we're going to be gaining the saline area that we were, we've lost anyways. So that's one of the strategies there. For the hillside seep, once again, we need to know where the coming, where the water's coming from and grow some deep rooted perennials to use that water. It's intercepting, intercepting water. So it's not a soil problem per se. It is a water vector issue. So we have to know where this water is coming from and, and use it before it gets to the surface. Now, when we start talking about saline tolerant species that we can be using in these areas, uh, sweet clover is is very uh, tolerant to to a lot of the the salinity. And what I like about the sweet clover is the biennial. So if we can get established that first year, it keeps growing right through the fall, keeps using water. Then when that the spring run uh, spring runoff stops, it's still going to be there and growing and using water. So this way, it's going to help. Number one, keeping that root channel, using water, making the system work. Chicory is another one that I've seen that works quite well in salinity, not as, as tough as sweet clover, but it, it's something where a little different root structure. Uh, it's not a legume, so this way it's going to be able to go in and, and in these areas with salinity, if you did a soil test, besides the fact that your, your uh, electric conductivity is through the roof, but normally your, your nitrogen, phosphate, potassium, uh, sulfur tends to be quite high because we've, you know, if you've been farming it, we've been putting inputs and we're not taking anything out. So having the chicory not being a legume, it has some advantages in there. Once again, it's a biennial, so it's uh, not too, too much of an issue for, for long-term contamination. But we also want to have some grasses in there. So this way we can, you know, start supporting this mycorrhizae, uh, getting some fiber in there, getting some some cover, some some ground cover, so that this way we can we can start getting some soil armor on it. So some something like perennial ryegrass, Russian wild rye, slender wheatgrass, tall wheatgrass, and tall fescue. 
when we start looking at whether we're going to be potentially grazing it or uh, just looking for ground cover or haying it, this is where using the right species is going to be important because if we start using something like tall wheatgrass, it's, it can grow in a lot of tough places, but not a lot of things will want to eat it if it gets too mature. So we have to watch palatability as, as the next thing. So if we're just looking for ground cover, awesome plant. If we're looking for actual feed, yeah, could be could be some other options. Some of the broadleaves you can use are sugar beets, uh, the fodder beets, uh, turnips, radish, sunflowers, and safflower. Some of the, the crops that we can be growing are fall rye and barley. Those are your, your more saline tolerant species. And I also like including in these mixes a moderately tolerant species to add into these mix. And the reason why I want to do that is it's going to be a marker plant. So when we start seeing a plant like Phacelia, we put a little bit of Phacelia in, it's relatively cheap per acre. And when we start seeing the Phacelia growing there, number one, it's a really great plant for produce, producing uh, a the soil aggregation very quickly creates good soil structure. But it's also fair tolerance to salinity. So when it starts growing somewhere, not, not only is it building soil structure for you quicker, but it's an indication that that area, now the, the electric conductivity has dropped. So we that's a win. We're starting to see a win there. So it's uh, to have something like that in there really, really is a, a quick marker. So as a quick summary, you know, not all salt is bad. So if we keep going in and, and you know, uh, trying to, to manage this so that we're, we're at zero for a salt, you have to remember that a lot of the fertilizers we put down are salts. So in, in soils in Western Canada, you know, most of the salts we're dealing with are chlorides or sulfates. So we need some. And so the, the whole analogy is it's the amount of the salt that is in the soil that is potentially bad. And there could be a time where we have too little salt in our soils, but most of the time we're dealing with too much. And this is one of the examples is, you know, salt on your, on your baked potato to, to throw in a little bit of salt on it makes it taste good. You put too much and it's not, <laughs> it doesn't taste good very, very, very anymore. Uh, Nicole Masters talks about uh, when uh, growing up, the, there was fires in New Zealand and they were putting these fires out with water bombers and they're going to the ocean and, and grabbing ocean water and and uh, and dropping it on these these hillsides and today even today you can still see which of the hills received a, that that shot of, of ocean water because they're, they're being more productive today the key to all of this is once you've identified an area as being saline, it should always be treated as a potential to going back to being saline. It isn't going to go away. It is going to be an issue. So we need to make sure that we remember that this area showed salinity. We've we recovered it. We've, I don't want to say masked it, but it, it's going to be something where we've, we've gone through, we've got the salts down, we've got production back, but we have to remember that that because the what's happening in the soil, it has the potential to go back to it. So we have to be cognizant of that. So there's some contact information if you have any questions, and I hope you enjoyed.